Hi, everyone. Um, is that Kurt by any chance? No, it's Michael Giuliano. Ah, Michael, welcome. Uh, all right. Uh, and so since Dr. Giuliano's on the line, we can begin. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to Today and Tomorrow, pri prioritizing uh, the present in the time of COVID. Um, and a special welcome to all of our students, uh, especially the M2s and all the folks from SHIMS and nursing who were out in the field doing good work and uh, are now dealing with not being there. My name is Brian Pilkington and I teach ethics across the three schools at Seton Hall University's Interprofessional Health Sciences Campus, the Hackensack Meridian School of Medicine, the College of Nursing, and the School of Health and Medical Sciences, uh, and also in the Department of Philosophy. This is the second installment of our COVID ethics series a multidisciplinary series focused on ethical issues that have arisen or intensified in light of the COVID pandemic. Last week, I spoke with folks from our medicine, nursing, PA, and paramedic communities. Our conversation centered on balancing concerns for personal and familial health uh, and safety with the duty that healthcare practitioners have to care for patients. I'm grateful to Professors McCarthy, Hannison, Rosenberg, Inella, and Josephs, and to Dean Stanton for joining me in that conversation. For those joining us for the first time, I'll briefly frame our conversation before turning to each of our panelists. And this is a good uh, time to remind everyone to please mute your phones and your videos, uh, just so we avoid feedback on the line. So for those joining us for the first time, I'll frame the ethical issues uh, and then turn to our panelists. They'll share their perspective with us for a few minutes and we'll close with some time for questions. We ask that you please mute your microphones. If you have questions, please write them in the chat box uh, on Zoom. We have a wonderful coordinator, Aaron Taylor, who's monitoring that. Um, or please tweet at us uh, at SHU Bioethics, that's S-H-U, B-I-O-E-T-H-I-C-S at SHU Bioethics. Uh, we'll address questions at the end of the session, so please hold your questions while the panelists are speaking. This week, we take up another set of ethical issues associated with COVID-19, which are made especially acute given the nature and duration, or more accurately, the anticipated duration of the pandemic. The New York Times reported this morning that even with uh, the $2 trillion economic stimulus, which was just signed into law uh, last Friday, Washington is already considering a fourth response package to combat the spread of the coronavirus and bolster a shuttering economy. As of yesterday evening, the CDC reported 140,904 cases, that is persons who are sick with COVID and 2,405 deaths due to COVID. The number of people who have become sick from COVID-19 continues to rise. Uh, and as this happens, our hospitals are overwhelmed with patients uh, and greatly in need of resources, both more advanced resources like ventilators, but also the most basic resources, masks and gowns, um, and other personal protective equipment aspects. Given the acute and immediate nature of this challenge to our healthcare resources, the reaction to go all in is understandable. And that might be the prudent option. However, in addition to these important health concerns are more forward-looking societal and economic concerns. In times of crisis, power and authority are often amassed in a more concentrated way than during other times. Uh, failures of an economy, increased unemployment, closing of businesses, drops in stock values, all of these things can have a long lasting effect and potentially greater impact. Challenges to the well-being, to the mental and emotional health of those who are not sickened by COVID-19, uh, but who are impacted through social distancing practices, through increased anxiety, through changes in work, changes in play, uh, changes generally in their lives, also affect the fabric of our society. And properly thinking through, balancing, and ultimately prioritizing what is most important has been complicated, 
uh, at least in this country, by the sharing of information by political leaders, which has been described as uh, uninformed, as misinformed, and even, I think in the starkest descriptions, as instances of disinformation. Wherever you stand on those questions, uh, most people agree that conflicting information from the same source adds to the challenge of proper prioritization. To address this problem, uh, we have experts from diverse disciplines, whom, I'm, whom I will introduce to you shortly uh, and more fully as they speak to us. We have a physician who specializes in infectious disease, a former hospital system CEO whose academic work focuses on organizational change and leadership, an ethicist who has just written the leading book on well-being, a bioethicist who leads ethics efforts at a large hospital system, an economist who can help us think through some of the complicated features of the economy compared with some health considerations, uh, and a political theorist who will help us think about uh, changes in authority and power structures as they relate to COVID-19. Uh, our first panelist uh, is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Boskamp. Uh, professor Boskamp, in addition to being a professor of pediatrics at the medical school, is associate dean of medical education continuum um, at the Hackensack Meridian uh, School of Medicine at Seton Hall University. Uh, Jeff is also the vice president and co-chief academic officer at HUMC uh, and chairman of the NJ chapter of um, the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Infectious Disease. Welcome, doc Dr. Boskamp. Uh, can you hear me on the line? Yeah, thank you very much, Brian, and thanks for all of your efforts in uh, putting this together, mm -hmm. a really uh, distinguished panel um, that I'm uh, honored to speak with today. So uh, let me get started. Um, let me, just to put things in context, I've practiced uh, clinical infectious disease in adults and children uh, for 35 years. Um, I have uh, was trained in the midst of the uh, AIDS epidemic. Um, have come through a number of other significant outbreaks in time. And let me just make it clear that there's nothing I've ever seen in my career uh, that compares to what we're going through now. Um, everything is upside down. All rules have changed. Workflows have changed. I've never seen an environment where we continually have to literally think outside the box. Every single day is a challenge. You mentioned the shortage of equipment. So we're short on personal protective equipment. We've changed rules as to who can wear what. This has created obviously great anxiety amongst all the caretakers who have been unbelievably brave and heroic as you've read about. But we're short also of basic equipment. We're short of staff. We're short of beds. At Hackensack University Medical Center, over the last five days, we've built a new 75-bed ICU out of our cafeteria. 50 or 60 union people have worked around the clock to build ICU beds with gases, with plumbing, and to have a brand new unit that a week ago uh, was serving cafeteria meals is just incredible. But we're doing things we never thought. And there's a simple example, I think, that I've come across that um, basically um, things we hadn't thought about. So to preserve personal uh, protective equipment, we had the idea that if we had extension tubing for IV pumps, as we do when we do MRIs, because the pumps can't be in the room with the MRI because of the magnet, right? So what the pump is kept outside with a long extension when we have to infuse things through the IV pump. Somebody had the idea that we would take these long extensions and put them out in the hall for all of our COVID patients. So the nurses didn't have to put gowns on, didn't have to put protective equipment and go into the room uh, every time the pump needed a new bag or was beeping because of occlusion. Just one example that we all of a sudden couldn't get our hands on enough extension IV tubing. But um, to come back to the question at hand, um, I'm asked as an infectious disease specialist often, what's the timeline? What's it gonna be like? 
that goes directly to this issue of how much we're real, willing to sacrifice. There are some very brilliant people, and some of them may be on this phone, that are doing very intense modeling. But the one thing I would say is Tony Fauci, who I've known and I have ultimate respect for, and as a person we should all be listening to closely, said last week that um, we will not set the timeline. The virus will set the timeline. And I think he's absolutely right. Except I would make the uh, case that, as you've seen, when you do this modeling, if you're able to do social distancing and self-quarantining, the curve shifts. Everyone, everyone in this phone call has endlessly heard about flattening the curve. Uh, but it's not just flattening the curve. It's a matter of how many deaths get modeled and how much economic disruption you're willing to do uh, in order to save lives. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to, that uh, there's no question that if people are to respect uh, the recommendations and are able to stay away from this, uh, we can tamp this down. And I think there's almost no doubt that we will save lives in many ways in terms of people infected, uh, but also in terms of the very tough decisions that are coming up in the hospital system about whether they can actually handle the volume, which is critical. Um, so I know everybody will have good questions. Um, I'll throw it back to you, Brian. Jeff, thanks very much. Um, just one quick follow-up, because um, in addition to all the good work um, that you and the other docs are doing, um, and the PAs, the nurses, all the healthcare um, members who are on the front lines, uh, you're both coming up with creative ways to think through how to address COVID, but all of the regular sorts of illnesses that are that present to the hospital are still coming in, right? So if I get an appendicitis, I, I, I'm still coming in, even if it's not a COVID-related illness. Um, any thoughts, recommendations, uh, this is sort of just off the top of your head, but about or experiences about how you guys are addressing those kinds of concerns. Some folks aren't going in and then it gets too late. Um, any thoughts you have would be most welcome. Sure. Well, we are seeing a significant decrease in our non-COVID patients. And uh, so it's a combination of a decrease in non-COVID patients coming in, but also, of course, this massive, massive onslaught of COVID patients. So in some of our hospitals, uh, like Hackensack, uh, we are seeing um, not only a huge expansion in numbers, uh, but we're seeing a major shift. I think we're approaching approximately 70% of the patients that are in Hackensack University Medical Center are uh, presumed or confirmed COVID patients right now. We're running numbers of ventilators like we've never seen before. But um, we have to give regular health care, and I don't think I've seen this um, more obvious uh, if you think about it, then our obstetric service, we deliver the most babies of any hospital at Hackensack University Medical Center in the state. All of those women are going to deliver as scheduled. So that service and a number of others are unchanged by this, and we've got to make it safe for them. And we have to, uh, you know, be able to provide the usual medical care. Our surgeries are down, but there are still people who have cancer who need their surgeries. So it's, uh, it, we're doing everything at once uh, and trying to keep everybody safe. Jeff, thanks a lot. And we may, um, in the Q&A, return, because um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion uh, nationally, but especially in the Northeast, regarding uh, practices associated with labor and delivery, partners in the room, and a variety of things. Um, but as we transition to our next panelist, um, just commending Jeff and everyone at HUMC for their work, uh, from an ethics perspective, taking seriously the duty to plan which is one of the primary duties, at least as far as ethicists are concerned, in times of crises. To be able to uh, do what you've done um, with the cafeteria and the other work is, is really commendable. Um, and so this is sort of a nice um, time to switch to our next um, presenter as I harp a bit on the duty of care and what organizations might fail to do and so fail in their ethics. Um, so uh, Terry Cahill, um, is the chair of the IHSA department within SHIMS. He's an associate professor um, uh, at Seton Hall University. Uh, he's run hospital systems before and his specialty areas in change and change management. So Professor Cahill, uh, can you hear me on the line? Yes, Brian, can you hear me? 
yes, you're coming in loud and clear. Right. Any thoughts you might have on the from the organizational perspective, thinking of times that aren't crisis to times when we are in crisis, anything you could share with us, personal experiences would be most welcome. Uh, sure, Brian. Um, first, my comments today are informed by three things. You know, first of all, as Brian has mentioned, my training and experience as a hospital executive, including uh, serving as a CEO at a, a community hospital, but also my training and experience as a social worker who often is often deals with crisis interventions. And in my doctoral education, I researched the concept of sense making, in specific, how executives make sense of what's going on around them in order to guide others to success. Based on these things, you know, I'd like to offer just a couple comments today, not so much focused on what we need to do, but rather how we need to do it concerning sense making and leadership. Let me begin. I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know when I say that we're confronting a massive sense making challenge. What the heck are we dealing with in coronavirus? As Dr. Boskamp just acknowledged, you know, never seen this before. Clearly nothing of this magnitude. We really don't know. And in sense making, if we haven't had a prior experience that helps us to make sense of what we're facing, we have to rely on others who have had that experience. But unfortunately, with the magnitude of our current pandemic, we don't have others with direct experience to guide us. And this leads us to our third option for sense making. We listen to experts who offer us their theories as to what they think is happening. And clearly, we are listening to the experts, as Dr. Boskamp just mentioned, uh, mentioned a prime example. The key thing, though, is that based on what we learn from others, in this case, uh, in today's case, you know, the experts, we develop a tentative understanding of what are we dealing with. And this positions us to take an action and see what happens. An analogy to the see what happens is when we begin to innovate, to try something new, we conduct smaller experiments, smaller attempts at something new, and then we stand back and take a look at how well did that work. And it, based on our evaluation, then we make adjustments to those actions. I'd like to accent my next comment that key to this process of sense making is that we're careful not to attempt extreme decisions as if that one major decision will fix all of our situation for the long term. By definition, there's no so silver bullet that will address the complexity of a mega crisis situation and resolve everything. Rather, situations of major crisis proportion call for a focus on taking smaller informed actions that while they too have some risk, they are less risky, risky than as they say, betting the ranch on a sure thing, an all or nothing situation. So based on this understanding of how we make sense of what we experience, the implications for us today are one that we'd be very cautious in planning any major decisions. Remember, no silver bullets to fix all. Two, it's more helpful to identify multiple short-term actions that we can that we think will help. And Dr. Boskamp just gave some examples, you know, from Hackensack uh, Meridian Hospital. And three, then we evaluate the outcomes of those short-term actions and adjust for future actions accordingly. My second comment, as I said, concerns leadership and how does how, what is it that leadership does during times of major crises? In, in normal routine times, leaders rely on best practices that de have developed over time. And then they guide or direct their followers based on those somewhat you know, proven facts. However, when we all, including our title leaders, are faced with a new major crisis that no, none of us have experienced before, top-down leadership will likely fail. The titled leaders do not have any better answers than others involved in crisis. So what do we do? Well, the leadership style in a crisis situation is that we turn to a shared leadership. In this context, the title leader's role changes from directing to facilitating. In our follower role, you and I, our role changes from waiting for the leader to direct us as to what we need to do and to, to rather joining in the problem solving and assuming leading roles ourselves. You may have heard the phrase, during crises, leaders emerge. We saw it in 9-11 with Giuliani, in World War II, Churchill, and there's many other examples along the way. That's what we need in our coronavirus response, a collaborative leading process. Who will be the leaders that emerge in our coronavirus response? More specifically, 
who will it be that our emergent leaders at SHU, at our campus, the healthcare campus? Thanks very much. But, Terry, thanks. Those are those are very helpful comments. Um, and just one quick follow-up question before um, before we move on. Um, any suggestions, recommendations for folks thinking through some of these challenges um, about the shared leadership model that you suggest, and maybe how that connects up with decisions? Because often you hear folks saying, "Okay, you know, when we're in a crisis." somebody's got to make the call uh, at a variety of levels and you want one person doing that. So it, it's a really big question, but if you have a quick comment, uh, a little more on the um, shared leadership, that would be super helpful. I think, I think what you're getting at, Brian, and, and your point is well taken, that, that everyone going off in their own direction, their own corner, um, because we're all leaders, which is the essence of what I was trying to get at, or potential leaders, you know, is, not, is not constructive, is not collaborative, quite honestly. And, and that really gets at the, at the decision making. So in, in decision making, there's, there's different levels of decision making. So, so what you're referring to is that in dealing with a major crisis, everyone should participate as much as they can in helping create understanding of what this is, create opportunities for what we, what we think we can do differently to, to make a difference. And I suspect that Dr. Boskamp's example of the hospital's uh, development of their, their new ICU in the cafeteria, you know, was not, you know, created out of one, one person's idea, but rather, you know, involved a whole variety of individuals coming together. But at the end of the day, then there is someone who does need to make the final decision. And so, so that doesn't um, discount the importance of the title leader, you know, making that, that final decision in many of these cases, but it also doesn't discount the importance of those in our midst um, stepping up and leaning into the situation to help help define uh, what it is we're dealing with and and the opportunities for action. Excellent. Thank you very much, sir. And we may pick up some of these themes later on in the Q and A, especially the contrast between hierarchical decision making um, and the amassing of power when we turn at, at the very end to our uh, political theorist. Um, now we're going to transition to our next panelist, Professor Kim. Uh, Richard, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am, Brian. Wonderful. Um, so uh, Richard Kim uh, is assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy at Loyola University, Chicago. Um, he's an ethicist in training and a shameless plug for those of you um, who are interested in thinking about well-being. This is a concept that comes up a great deal in health science discussions. Uh, Dr. Kim just put out from Rutledge, Confucianism and the Philosophy of Well-Being, um, which is the book now uh, on well-being. So um, with that sort of bit of an introduction, Professor Kim, are there uh, anything you, would, uh, you could share with us on well-being, uh, considerations of well-being uh, given COVID uh, and what's happening in our society? Yes, uh, uh, thank you so much for this uh, for inviting me to this panel. I, I usually don't uh, participate in discussions like these. Uh, uh, I, I primarily work on moral philosophy and um, in, in a, uh, across a number of traditions and um, often are engaged in kind of more theoretical concepts and arguments as most philosophers are, which um, also gives us a kind of bad rap and sometimes rightly so. So it's kind of actually refreshing to hear all these wonderful practical suggestions and kind of getting um, people who know what's going on, 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 the, on at the ground level. And um, I worry a little bit that my comments will seem a little too conceptual, too theoretical, but uh, what can a philosopher uh, contribute here? I mean, I think the doctors and um, so many of you, uh, uh, the scientists are doing such great work and working so hard. Um, so as I was thinking about what what is what is it that a, a philosopher who works on well-being might contribute to this to this discussion? I, I was thinking about some of the these classical Chinese traditions that I had been working on, both Confucianism and Taoism. And um, one one of the uh, ideas that um, is central to the, to the Confucian account of well-being is that humans are deeply interdependent. And what's kind of ironic about the coronavirus, in my view, is the way that we actually have to practice this social distancing, partly because we are such interdependent creatures. We're 
fragile, we're vulnerable. And there's a kind of profound irony there about the way in which, especially in this globalized world, we're just so deeply connected. And as much as sometimes we don't get along with people or sometimes we you know, have um, uh, sometimes more than petty grievances, um, it shows just how social human beings are. And that's, of course, an idea you find in Aristotle and the ancient Greeks, but also uh, certainly in the Confucian tradition that, that at the heart of well-being are the social connections we have. And um, of course, that part it has been um, difficult uh, to realize um, these days because we all do have to sort of uh, keep our distance, although in, in one sense, we're being social right now as well. So I think um, there are always these lessons to, to, be, uh, to be learned according to many of these um, uh, classical Chinese thinkers. Um, and I think in this case, the Taoists are also very, very good about realizing because during the uh, ancient Chinese period, people also, of course, dealt with all kinds of human sufferings. And you can um, imagine, of course, at that time, they were just, uh, you know, basically you'd be wiped out because uh, there's no modern medicine. And so people had to deal with very difficult, challenging issues. And one of the um, Taoist approaches, and um, it's, it's an idea that you find, of course, in Buddhism as well, is just how much human perspectives and the mindset deeply influence and shape the way uh, we conceive of our well-being or happiness. And um, I say that with a little bit of caution because we don't want to downplay the actual substantive challenges we face, which are absolutely real, that has to be dealt with. But at the same time, the Taoists are always very good about taking sort of a broader perspective on everything, even very difficult things like including death. So Zhuangzi, the famous Chinese philosopher, discusses in a variety of parts of the text the way in which, for example, his wife dies and how he deals with it. So these things like death and human suffering has always been with us. And I think that Taoists um, tend to think that when we're in it, it's so hard to kind of take a wider perspective because it's so challenging and you're just suffering. But there's always a way in which these sorts of experience can have a, a positive, transformative um, outcome. And um, we need to also be able to realize that the struggles and hardships can become part of a narrative, I think. And this is one idea that you find, for example, in Alistair McIntyre, that human lives are, are lived in stories and narratives. And one of the ways in which our, our stories or our lives can go well or flourish is when we're able to take some of those earlier, sometimes tragic circumstances, sometimes hardships, pain and suffering, and be able to make something out of it. And so that was one of the thoughts I had about uh, when, when it came to this topic, because we're talking about sort of present and future and, uh, and how we might be able to sort of ultimately make sense out of this. Because at the end of the day, I do think eventually, unless we just all perish, we will come out of this. And how do we, from a broader perspective, um, sort of help to provide a kind of narrative that's inspiring, that moves us forward? So those are uh, just some basic thoughts I had. Hey, Professor Kim, thank you. I mean, the, the framing and the, the references uh, to the vast array of thinkers is super helpful, uh, especially the notion about interdependence. Um, I haven't heard anyone put the point in just that way, but it really is, as you say, ironic, given how interdependent we are, yet the common recommendation from Dr. Fauci, who was mentioned by Dr. Voskamp earlier, um, Mario Cuomo, because uh, I'm, excuse me, Andrew Cuomo, because I'm a New Yorker. I know Governor Murphy has said this for uh, those in Jersey. I mean, there's a strong push for social distancing when we are such interdependent creatures. So uh, thank you very much for that framing. I think that'll give us a lot um, to think about. And uh, for all the students on the line, they, I'm sure, are happy to hear you reference McIntyre as uh, they've run into that once or twice in classes of mine. So that's that's much appreciated. Uh, we're going to move uh, from uh, Professor Kim to uh, Professor Jeff Burns. Uh, Jeff, are you on the line? I am, yes. Wonderful. Uh, so Professor Burns is uh, Assistant Professor of Philosophy um, at Grand Valley State University. Uh, Jeff is trained in bioethics and wears a variety of hats and has recently in um, Jeff uh, explained because I don't know exactly the title, but has recently taken on a good, a good, taken on a good deal of the ethics work um, at uh, 
a health system where he is. So, uh, Jeff, could you say a little bit more about that? And then I've got some questions for you. Sure. I can tell you that uh, basically with the closure of the university and the move to online teaching, as we're all experiencing, I have taken on uh, full-time responsibilities as a clinical ethicist at Spectrum Health Hospitals, a large healthcare system here in Michigan um, that has basically just been focused on the preparation, the policy preparations for uh, the coming surge. Excellent. Thank you. So um, I'm going to link the conversation back up and please uh, take it where you like. But um, it struck me after Dr. Boskamp's comments and Dr. Uh, Cahill's comments that this duty to care, which I mentioned, um, excuse me, the duty to plan, which some institutions have taken on um, in a very serious and thoughtful way. Um, you may be uniquely placed to discuss this given both your ethical training and your involvement um, with the health system. Any thoughts before you share um, anything else from your perspective? Any thoughts on the duty to plan? So I, I want to echo the duty to plan. And I think that uh, both the material um, clinical component needs to be in that. But I think it's the same is true for ethicists. And if anything, ethicists can really be driving and, and pushing for that uh, duty to plan. I can tell you at my organization, uh, that's the way it went. Uh, it was actually the ethicists, the physicians and the clinical side were very much focused on um, some of the details about what they anticipated and that prevented them from really being able to track uh, with some of the developments both in uh, Bergamo in Northern Italy and some that came out of China. And I think that that really just the monitoring of data. So we're slightly more isolated out here and we don't have the same network of hospitals to have a word of mouth uh, spread as well. And it really required some people to be focusing on some of the news and stories that were coming out to help motivate that planning. That fell to the ethicist where I am. So I can tell you that, that just having that role uh, was a really important part of this, uh, this system getting prepared. Frankly, other than that, uh, I, I can't say that I think um, planning a couple weeks out is really the kind of planning you want in mind. It seems to me that, you know, uh, I understand that as a society, we're really all facing something that is, uh, you know, no one in living memory had to plan for anything like this. Uh, and so what we're doing is something, some simulacra of planning uh, as, as the surge comes. But uh, what, what I think one takeaway from this is uh, we, can't, uh, we can't wait until the worst events are on the horizon to try and make the best kind of plans. To have our best thinking is to think a little bit further out than this. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and so any other, again, from your, from your sort of dual role mm -hmm. um, in your training in bioethics and clinical ethics, anything else you could share with us relative to the big question of sort of focusing on now, but sort of keeping an eye to mm -hmm. what's coming in the future? Well, I think, uh, I think that that's good. I, I appreciate everything that was said. I appreciate that, uh, you know, as a professor of philosophy, I, I agree with Professor Kim that, you know, a lot of time we live in a kind of ideal world of arguments and that it's uh, both our challenge and, uh, and a necessity to come down to that, to try and make some practical applications to those, to those things. One brief example, uh, you know, we were, were thinking about some of the rationale about our uh, scarce resource allocation. We we're thinking about PPE in particular and thinking about, well, look, you know, some of the uh, hospital systems in the area are thinking about ways to preserve PPE and, and putting up arguments. And one of the arguments that's been put forward by some healthcare systems is that moving uh, COVID patients to a DNR upon admission, one of the justifying arguments was that that would help uh, you know, uh, save PPE and protect our uh, nursing staff from some of their vulnerability. Um, I can tell you that the nursing staff, uh, you know, heard that argument, saw it as an argument about protecting them, and yet they uh, already showed signs of distress about thinking that the, the determination of code status for patients in their protection was going to have a moral weight on them. And so part about planning is part about seeing about what the impact, the real ground impact of your arguments are, even in the people who are being benefited by those arguments. Thank you, that's, um, that's very helpful. And actually for those of you who are on our, um, who joined our session last week, you'll see a nice um, connection between 
those comments that Jeff has made and considerations of moral distress with some of the comments made by our practitioners last time. Um, thank you very much, Jeff. I'm going to transition now as we move through, and we'll, I'm sure, bring you back in for the Q&A, um, to Professor Kurt Rothoff. Uh, Kurt, are you on the line? I am. Wonderful. Uh, thanks for joining us. Professor Rothoff is professor in the Department of Economics and Legal Studies uh, at Seton Hall University. Uh, he's an economist. So, uh, Professor Rothoff, um, so far our discussion has moved from some health considerations to some more some leadership considerations, philosophical depths, broad questions about how we address a pandemic now while thinking about future resources. And what's come up a lot um, in more popular conversations is sort of balancing concerns about health and the folks that are sick now with possible impacts given um, a lack of attention uh, to economic considerations, or at least if lack is too strong, just how you balance those things. So any thoughts you could share with us for a few minutes would be most welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, like you said, I'm a professor in the business school. Uh, my primary fields are financial economics and industrial organization, but I'm mainly an applied microeconomist. But I really think about how how the finance world and, and organizations and, and markets themselves impact the individual. And um, in doing that, right, so we're in a, a massive crisis now that is, as everyone said, has, is unseen for anybody that's alive right now. Uh, we currently see unemployment effects where, you know, hourly workers have been decreased in their hours by something like 60% relative to two months ago. 55% uh, of the businesses have closed their doors. Small businesses have closed their doors at this point in time. Um, the, the economy has come to a, a grinding halt for a lot of people out there, uh, which is a crazy and scary time. Um, and and I, I totally buy in. Um, I'm, I am uh, in my house with my three children and wife, uh, staying home and doing this. And I, I buy the flattening the curve. But the economist in me also sees the major economic implications of this as well. Um, you see a lot of people that are unemployed uh, currently being pushed into unemployment. Uh, a lot of people who are, are working remotely or attempting to work remotely. Um, I think the, the economist in me again says, look, I, I understand that this is necessary, but if this lingers on for a very long period of time, uh, the longer that the economy is halted, the harder it is gonna, to get things going again as smooth as they were before. Small businesses just don't have profit margins to last a long time. Restaurants uh, don't have very high profit margins. A lot of these places and the people that I've talked to in those industries go, look, I, I can float two or three weeks, maybe, but you start hitting a month plus, and I just don't have that kind of money to, to continue the business. We will shut our doors. Uh, so the question is, how do we get, get these businesses to remain open? Because I think most of us wish we were going there right now and would like to go there. Uh, but we feel like it's the right thing to do not to be going uh, to these different places. Uh, I'm not working out anymore. I'm not going to the restaurants, right? Uh, the, that part, so the longer we go, the longer that we expand this, this uh, social distancing, this uh, self-quarantining to stay at home, the harder it is gonna get the, get the economy to get, get these gears rolling again. Um, so as of right now, uh, you know, I, I was talking with my wife last night and I basically said, look, if we can get, get some things moving by the end of April, whether it's all or not, but if at least we can get some of the economy move, moving again by the end of April, I think we'll have a smooth transition. But if it starts to last months on end, it's gonna get very difficult to get things moving again. Not only will it be difficult to get things moving again, but as people become unemployed for longer periods of time, uh, there's all kinds of other social issues, uh, health issues, uh, mental stability. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that when people are home over breaks, uh, there's increases in child abuse, there's increases in domestic abuse, uh, there's increases in, in other mental, mental illnesses. Uh, and certainly the people who have lost their jobs now are, are, are wondering, when I get back, is that job going to be there? Uh, for two reasons. One, uh, is, is the business still going to exist at all? Uh, and if it does exist, when I show up, are they gonna realize during this period that they didn't really need me to begin with? Um, and so the longer this draws on, I think the more people are gonna be worried about that, which is gonna have other impacts. Um, so yeah, from the, from the economy perspective, we do have to worry about both uh, the, the bed space, which I think is the big issue with flattening the curve. Right? We want uh, to be a capacity constrained issue at hospitals and we know that that exists. 
Um, but if it gets too hard to start the economy back up, we're starting to head into territories where there are other issues that are become very big and, and very uh, necessary to deal with. Kurt, uh, thanks very much for the helpful comments and for drawing our attention to the fact that there are um, a variety of health concerns, which though sort of are results of the COVID pandemic, though not sort of direct COVID um, cases or persons with COVID. Um, before I transition to our political theorist, um, we, it seems like we're stuck, um, or at least we have to try to figure out how to balance, um, you know, your recommendations of maybe late April, as soon as we can to get things back up and running or start to get them back up and running in terms of the economy and the ramifications of that, right? We have to balance those aims with recommendations of the leading health professionals about social distancing to decrease, um, right, to, to stop this pandemic. Uh, any sort of quick thoughts on that balancing or is that something that should really be uh, with a large group or be figured out by a large group? Um, I, I think there are, are multiple factors in it, right? So, um, you know, there's economists coming out now going, look, the, the estimated life savings of, of social distancing for five to six months could be two million lives saved, which is a, a very high value uh, to the economy because we want these people around because we are social beings. They're part of the economic system as well. Uh, there's a lot of things going on there. Uh, but I, I also think that the, the, the complete halt the, the complete halt of government mandate, mandated halt um, was necessary to show how, how important it was and how strict it was. The question is, could there be businesses functioning right now in a safe way that wouldn't cause excess issues with the pandemic that are on a halt because the blanket statement of everybody should stop was easier than figuring out who can keep going safely. Um, so one of the possibilities is that as we move forward with this and we do still need to maintain social distancing and we need to maintain slowing down the spread, could it be done in a strategic fashion in which way it is not a complete halt of the economy, but rather a strategic curbing of which types of activities exist in those places. Excellent. Thank you. And we, we see a theme. Um, I'll just draw everyone's attention to it, whether it's from Dr. Boskamp's point about um, we're, about extending the tubes in an interesting and creative way, Dr. Cahill's stressing of innovation right in times of crisis, or the creativity that um, Professor Rod Rodhoff is suggesting in terms of balancing sort of just going back to business as usual, as opposed to creative solutions um, to get something going that's still safe. Um, it seems like creativity and innovation uh, are key. Thank you, Professor Rodhoff. Now I'm gonna to turn to Professor Patterson, uh, our resident political theorist on this panel. Uh, Molly, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Wonderful. Uh, professor Patterson is chair of the political science department at Aquinas College where she is associate professor. Um, and though it's a department of political science, she is a political theorist uh, by training. So Molly, you, you've heard a lot of our, our panelists um, and there's so much to say, but where I wanted to point you to, if that's all right, is considerations of amassing authority um, in times of crisis. How do good political theorists think about this sort of now, later? Anything you could share would be most welcome. Well, this is something that political theory has been thinking a lot about as it is, um, especially following a variety of elections in 2016, um, starting with Brexit, including the US uh, presidential election, but also elections around the globe, um, political theorists and political scientists have really been worried about what is happening with political authority and what's happening in liberal democracies right now. And by liberal democracies, I, I mean um, democracies that have as a core characteristic the preservation of individual rights and civil liberties. Um, and, and so people were already worried about what's happening with liberal democracies given what appears to be an almost global increase in um, nationalist sentiments and um, kind of populist tendencies that seem to be motivated in large part by economic 
anxiety and anti-immigrant sentiment. So these were already trends we were seeing, um, and, and there are books that have come out in the last couple of years with titles like How Democracies Die, uh, and Can It Happen Here? Authoritarianism in America, um, by, by big name political scientists that indicate that there seems to be something, something happening globally that's a little bit different and a little bit worrisome. And so this crisis steps into that already existing stew of people showing an inclination to embrace authoritarian leadership and very um, sort of anti-liberal tendencies, particularly in how they treat minority populations. Um, and so we can ask not only what happens in times of crisis, but what happens with this crisis in this moment that's already exhibiting these tendencies. Um, and there are some features of this that make it really hard. As people have pointed to, um, it's an ambiguous situation. We don't understand it. We don't, as um, Dr. Cahill said, we don't know how to make sense of this situation. Dr. Boskamp pointed to all of the ways in which rules are breaking down. And so in this, this period of tremendous ambiguity, it's really hard to assess what is reasonable and what makes sense for us to do. Um, we are unclear on who to trust. Um, Dr. Cahill talked about trusting the experts and, and, and recognizing expertise. And I, that makes a lot of sense to me, except that what I see from working with the students I deal with and hearing what they say, we really don't have a shared sense of where expertise lies and who can be trusted. Um, and of course, this is exacerbated by challenges in media coverage. Um, already, our media landscape was, was tremendously challenging, and I think The Atlantic recently had an article about what is the fate of media in the current crisis. Um, but one feature of the situation is that we are so consumed with COVID and what's happening in this moment with COVID and, and then paying attention to, to numbers, you know, how many people are ill and all of that's really important, but it also makes it really easy for really other big things to happen without us noticing and without much coverage. So the EPA recently suspended the enforcement of environmental regulation. Um, so any business out there that says it is not able to comply with environmental regulation right now um, potentially just doesn't have to if, if they say that for COVID-related reasons, and, and this is applying to like the oil and gas industry, is able to say, well, they can't fulfill their uh, environmental obligations right now and they're being exempted from that. So. Lots of things are happening with rules and political authority and people are worried. They're feeling insecure and scared for really good reasons. So it makes us more willing to accept leadership that, in, and authoritarianism seems to be opportunistic, right? That, that there may be um, extraordinary measures that we need to take for good and moral reasons, but there can be bad actors that also see those measures as expedient um, or convenient. So we know that Hungary just suspended its parliament um, and, and voted extraordinary um, powers to Viktor Orban. Um, so there are just a couple of things we might keep an eye on. I mean, there, there are so many things, but two that leap to mind. Um, one is what happens with elections. We've already suspended a number of primaries in a bunch of states. We've got a general election coming up in November. Um, how do we plan for a system that is robust enough that we can continue one of the core practices of democracy in these challenging times. And the other question, the, the other 
issue not just consolidation of authority at the top, but also the practices of authority on the ground. Um, what happens with policing? So right now, people are being given forms from their employers here um, if they are essential workers so that they can have safe passage from home to work. So that if they get stopped by the police for being out, they can document that they have been deemed essential. So even though the governor's order explicitly says that you can still travel, you can still go to parks, you can still go out for exercise, we're seeing policing practices that are maybe very contrary to the policing practices that we might hope to expect in a free society. Um, so in light of all of that, the questions are, what are the mechanisms we can use to ensure that the measures we take now out of necessity and for good moral reasons do not fundamentally erode the core tendons and practices on which a free and self-governing society depend? Um, you know, things to not do. Indefinite grants of authority rules that never end, you know, but we do not seem to be very good at putting into place the safeguards that tell us when we will stop and reevaluate. How will we decide whether these extraordinary measures that we are taking now, whether it's time for those to end? Um, so I guess I'm a little anxious. <laughs> I think, uh, thank you, Professor Patterson. Uh, I think uh, anxiety covers many of us. Um, so I, I appreciate both the human element and the, the sort of carefulness in the response. Um, I will take the moderator's prerogative. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, I'll take the moderator's prerogative and ask the first one. But anyone, if you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat feature. Um, of Zoom or tweeted at us at Shoe Bioethics. So there are, are a few themes running through the conversations and the comments from all of our panelists. In particular, I've already mentioned the sort of on the ground um, importance of creativity and innovation um, that's come through. A second theme, which was raised by Professor Patterson, um, so I'll direct the question uh, to you, Molly, but any panelist who could comment, uh, please feel free to jump in in a somewhat orderly fashion. Is how do we think about trust? So I understand trust um, and have great trust in the work that Dr. Voskamp and many others are doing, partly because I'm fortunate to spend time at HUMC to know what's going on there, to know all of the efforts that are, that are being employed. And I'm fortunate enough to have conversations with folks who are doing some of the planning sorts of work where I see the efforts, I see the attention to detail. But, um, Molly, to your point, when I flip on the news and I see Governor Cuomo say something, I see President Trump say something else, um, depending on which channel I flip on, there's different sorts of mechanisms or different sorts of views. And I'm focused on COVID-19, thinking about all sorts of bioethical and social questions. I am less focused. I didn't even realize the changes to the EPA. So how do so we as members of a society, this interdependent society, as Professor Kim highlighted, uh, any, recommendation, any recommendations on how we can trust? That is such a big question. I guess one of the things that has struck me just from conversations I've had with people over the years, and, and I saw an article about this recently, I need to find again, um, about how emotional and intuitive trust is in certain regards, that we have different gut reactions about who is trustworthy, um, that are not, easy to explain and cannot be simply, um, ex they're, they're not just fully rational and, and they're, they're hard to decipher. Um, I do think it goes to a larger point though about a literate, educated society that is able to weigh evidence um, that 
to some extent the willingness of, I mean, we've seen this with people taking medical advice online, um, the extent to which people are willing to give credibility to perspectives that seem to have no rational basis and there's no evidence and, and they don't have the habit of mind of looking for evidence and being educated about scientific reasoning. So, I mean, I end up falling back on some really basic, more philosophy and more science for everybody. Uh, Dave, uh, and a welcome recommendation given the audience, of course. Um, we have a couple minutes left and then I'll have some announcements. Were there any other panelists who any thoughts or reflections on uh, the notion of trust? We do have a couple of questions in the chat. Wonderful. Um, can, Brian, can I just please. jump in on trust there? Please do, Jeff. Jeff, please. Jeff Burns, yeah. I just want to say that I think that, uh, <clears throat> you know, at working with the healthcare system, uh, we owe it to the public to be as transparent as we can. Uh, I do agree, like working with the folks uh, in the healthcare system, uh, I know how good their intentions are. I know they're striving to do some good things. Um, and so uh, I, I, like you, see a lot of that good work and admire that. Um, I do think that those healthcare systems and we and those of us that work in those systems need to keep in mind that that view of their good intentions is not available to everyone equally. And therefore we owe some transparency uh, in every way that we can uh, to try and try and assuage some of that. Just we, we, are, we are asking a lot of an entire society based on the authority of, of medical professionals and we just need to know uh, uh, that people have put a lot of trust in us and we need to be as open as we can be. Thank you, Professor Burns. Any other panelists' final comments on, um, on uh, trust as I check our chats for one question? Then I will jump to the question. So we have a question from uh, members of the audience. Um, they've asked how the numbers, um, how do we think the numbers of uh, persons affected by COVID can decrease if there is no national shelter in place across the U.S.? So this is the question um, due to time that'll wrap us up, but I think it's a wonderful concluding question because it sort of in a very practical way focuses on um, or applies the broader question of cooperation and collaboration and interdependence. So any, um, any panelists uh, who could speak to how we can look to sort of address this problem without broad policies um, such as a national shelter in place across the entire U.S. Yeah, it's Jeff Boskamp. I'll jump in on this a little bit. I'm just quickly, um, you know, be careful. A couple of panelists have said, you know, that, um, you know, seeing the numbers on TV is, is consuming and crowds out everything. And that is just so, so true. Um, but be careful with the numbers. Um, I think everybody's fully aware of the issues around testing. The vast majority of people that are in New York City right now that are having symptoms know exactly what they have and have never been tested. Those numbers are basically unimportant at this point in terms of those total numbers. The total numbers of deaths is a real number and one that is we're all you know saddened and in mourning about. That is a real number and that means a lot. But you know to think that you could do this individually by states. Um, and and that people are going to um, not move this virus, um, is, you know, is a fallacy. And the fact of the matter is that we now have enough data to look back and say, you know, we know we knew when it was in New York now, and we didn't have any idea it was really here to the degree it was at that time. So any area of the country that thinks um, they don't have it, they probably have it right now. So there needs to be a policy everywhere and everybody, you know, is mortified by some of the pictures of people that still don't understand this and are grouping together in huge groups. And we've seen again and again um, from New Orleans to uh, a number, you know, a, a funeral in Georgia where nobody had any idea what was going on and it had horrendous circumstances that followed. Um, 
So yeah, no, it, it takes it takes national policy and it takes national policy to get the resources that everybody needs. You can't um, have this where it's being done piecemeal. Jim, uh, Jeff, thank you very much for that. Um, unfortunately, everyone, we're, uh, we've, we've actually run over time. Um, I know there were a number of questions still in the chat. Um, we'll leave this recording up for a moment, then we'll stop our programming. Um, and any comments and questions in the chat, we can always pick up offline. Also, I encourage you, if you have topics, specific COVID topics uh, for discussion, please feel free to email us at ethics at shoe.edu. It's up on the screen now. Please also join the Microsoft team. Um, that information has been placed in the chat. You can text IHS events to 55000 for other information and do follow us at SHU Bioethics. Now, um, for all our panelists, thank you so much. I know how busy all of you are, especially with all that's going on. Thank you for joining us. Everyone would clap on the line, but that would just echo too much in our ears. So thanks to everyone who's joining us. Thanks very much to our panelists. And please um, join us again next week, Tuesday, 1230 to 130. We'll pick up on our next set of COVID topics, which are connected up with sport and activity. So thank you all very much, um, and please stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Brian. You.